welcome back to Monday night. Uh, it's once again Pastor Craig Appreciation Night. I think I can count on probably one hand over the last four years how many times I've had to cover for him on Monday night. He has an excellent attendance record uh, for which he has received several blue banners uh, to hang in his room. Thanks Pastor Craig. If you're watching this, this is a test to see if you watch. Uh, <laughs> I want you to, to, to come back to me and say, you're welcome if you watch this. All right, very good. In honor of Pastor Craig, uh, quick review. Um, who wrote the book of Hebrews? <laughs> good, all right. We're not sure, for, we're not for positive, although some people are confident. Uh, when was uh, Hebrews written-ish? Before the destruction of Jerusalem, I believe it was written soon before that. Yeah. It's about, you know, Timothy getting out of prison. Paul never talked about him being in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Things I've read suggest between 60 and 70. Mm -hmm. Good. And then what is the overarching theme of uh, Hebrews? Of Christ. All right. Two answers for Rob. Welcome back. We and, missed you. And a question. Oh, and a question. Okay. Uh, you, Craig mentioned something early on about well, a verse he thought that suggested it wasn't Paul, and I was looking for it, and I couldn't find it. Do you remember what that was? No. No. I'm pretty sure I do. Let me look. Thanks. Okay. All right. Yeah. And so, uh, as Rob has set the precedence, uh, questions are uh, welcome and encouraged at any point tonight. In fact, you may have to try harder or raise your hand higher to ask me a question, because sometimes I get on a monologue roll and I don't slow down. So, uh, let me know what you're thinking, especially if you have a question, but uh, if you have a counterpoint, uh, by all means, bring it up and uh, let's... Let's not go away with, with questions, at least not voiced, as we leave tonight. It's hard for me to know exactly what verse we're on based upon the last two weeks. I have been here the last two weeks, uh, but I'm, I think that we wrapped up verse 26 last week. Does anybody remember anything different? I thought it was 25. Okay, you, yeah, so, uh, okay, then... Good enough for me. We we will, we will, restart with with twenty six then, because that's a kind of a, a break in the chapter and line of thinking anyway. Uh, so, let's do that. Let me read, or I'll ask before I have to read. I'll ask for a volunteer. Does somebody want to read twenty six through thirty nine? Hey, I see Chloe's joined us. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you, Captain Chloe. And and you are not on mute, sir. Just so you know, in case there are any family secrets going on. Wait, Greg's trying to mute. All right, he's good now. All right, uh, 26 through 39, anybody? Thank you. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour our adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be brought worth? thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days in which, after you were eliminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings partly while you were made a spectacle both 
by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring position for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are, but we are not, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right. First thing I want to point out is the plural pronouns and uh, the notion that um, st maybe starts back in 19, therefore brothers, plural. Verse 23, let us, plural, hold fast the confession. Verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another and not neglecting, not neglecting the meeting together, but encouraging one another. So. There's this idea of, of team sport that I see in the plurality. And even in the last verse, he continues with the, but we, um, being a collective consideration of all of us. And I always try to point that out when I see it because I think specifically for us in Western culture and in the United States of America, we have this rugged individualism that is indoctrinated in us from a very young age, which can be unbiblical. Uh, so the church is interdependent upon itself. Remember our studies about 1 Corinthians talking about the gifts that God grants to each believer for the purpose of mutual edification of the brothers and sisters. So we need each other. That's a fact. I don't care what... <laughs> America proposes the scriptures. God's word tells us that we need each other. It's a, it's a team sport. So in verse 26, we start tonight, for if, okay, so this is not when, this is not for sure, but this is a, a postulation, a pos a perhaps a possibility that the things following, if the things following apply to you, then... This is going to be one of those warnings. In fact, is it the fifth warning we've received so far in the book and, and perhaps the most serious warning, I think? Uh, because I think we did mention the vocabulary word that 26 through 31 addresses starts with an A. Anybody remember that? Uh, yes, apostasy. Now that Shannon has correctly identified the word theming these verses, anybody remember definition? Falling away. Falling away. So, to further clarify the subset of individuals that we're considering, are apostate individuals unbelievers? Yes, every apostate is an unbeliever. Is every unbeliever an apostate? No. No. So, um, it's dependent upon um, knowledge, and specifically knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the, Messiah, the Savior of the world. And I constantly remind myself of the title of the letter, Hebrews, which are religious people, right? Um, so they have a lot of corporate knowledge about the one true and living God. So that, you know, with more knowledge, 
comes more responsibility, more accountability, greater judgment, the more you know. Not that um, making an error or, or, uh, is ever excused, but certainly we understand in our humanity the severity of punishment associated with Oh, the difference uh, when when it's your hand that causes the life of another to be ended. There's a different legal term for if it was determined to be intentional or if it was accidental. Right? Do you know the different terms? Manslaughter. Yeah, manslaughter, unintentional, and first degree murder worst, you know, intentional. So, and they come with different sentences in, in the legal system as well. So, all right, that's good, I think, backdrop for verse 26. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, okay? So if we is referring to a religious group of people, all right? Not necessarily a believing group of people. But it is a religious group of people that's being addressed here. And uh, go on. Remember last week I tried to re relate the phrase go on to habitual, like it's a pattern. It's consistent. Uh, it's the norm. And sinning deliberately uh, was the crime here. And often people of sensitive conscience can be misguided in understanding what does this mean sinning deliberately and and may there may be undue weight placed upon their shoulders as they consider that phrase like oh i mean i i i knew this was wrong and i did it anyway so i i sinned deliberately and yes christians can do that because we in general know most of what is wrong and so we still have remaining sin this side of heaven and are imperfect by definition. We haven't been glorified. And so I venture to say that that at one point or another has happened or will happen in every Christian's life this side of heaven, that they will do something against or short of God's standard or they won't do something that God's standard says they should do and know that the fact that they did it or didn't do it was wrong. Therefore, it's deliberate. So, as we think about just that phrase, you think, okay, if every believer could be considered to have sinned deliberately, then, you know, surely we're not talking. Of, that's one clue as to who the audience is, as to who's being pointed at in this particular sentence. After receiving knowledge of the truth is a specific reference to the fullness of the mystery revealed about the Messiah, the gospel, the good news of salvation through Christ. Um, knowledge in general, the Greek word is gnosos, and this word is epignosos, which renders it a full and complete knowledge. Remember how we were ta talking before the study, reference the gospel and the Messiah that even the angels long to look into some of the truths that were alluded to in the Old Testament but not fully revealed. Now in the New Testament, the gospel is fully revealed uh, and recognized its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the people who are sinning deliberately are doing so post-enlightenment, post Full explanation, clear articulation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Um, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Are Jewish religious people familiar with a sacrificial system for sins? Yes. They're very familiar. And we've talked about that throughout and one of the supremacies of Christ we went over was that he was the supreme sacrifice so the point the writer is making to his Jewish audience is the clear articulation has been made for Christ as the Messiah the fulfillment of all the prophecies 
if you're going to sin deliberately against this fully disclosed gospel, you can't go back to Judaism. You can't go back to the animal sacrifices, which is another reason to think that this was written prior to AD 70. Because what happened in AD 70? The Russian Rome comes in, sacks Jerusalem, destroys the temple, it, the temple, and for all intents and purposes, that's when animal sacrifices ended in in the Jewish economy. So I think this allusion to the notion that you can be fully exposed to the gospel and then go back and say, nah, after further exploration and consideration, I'm just going to go back to the way it was. And I think that would be a normal thought in my humanity because who loves change? Nobody. Pete and I were just talking about this on, on Sunday. As a general rule, we don't like change. Change is hard. We resist change. There's some physical laws that describe that. You know what the resistance to change is called in one word? Physics? It starts with an I. Inertia. Inertia. Straight from Army Intelligence. See? Proof. Things in motion tend to want to stay in motion. Things at rest tend to want to stay at rest. We don't like to change. And so it would make sense in my humanity that I would say, yeah, you know what, I'm going to go back to what I'm used to. The animal sacrificial system. In anticipation of what? Even in anticipation of the coming Messiah. Because I know the Old Testament, I know the prophecies that there is going to be a Messiah coming, but I've just decided that Jesus is not the Christ. He's not the Messiah. All the truths have been fully disclosed to me. Epigenosos, I understand exactly what you're talking about, but I've come to the conclusion, no, I don't think so. I, I received it at first. I've been here for I don't know how long, an undetermined amount of time, but now I'm going to fall away. I'm going to go back to where I was. And remember, Pastor Craig has brought up the parable of the seeds because the two middle seeds, they hear it, and they're like, oh, yeah, shoot up. One gets heat, one gets thorns and thistles. Bottom line is neither one of those seeds produce fruit, which is the telltale sign. No fruit, no apple tree. Um... So, they're going to fall away, and the warning is, you, you can't fall away back to status quo. You can't fall away back to, you're good with the animal sacrifices, and you're still on track and pleasing God. You can't fall away in anticipation of looking for another Messiah to come. This is it. Like you, There's no fuller revelation than what we've been given about the supremacy of Christ. If you fall away... There's no coming back, first of all, to atone for your sin. There no longer remains a sacrifice for your personal individual sins. Comma. Just a thought. Wonderful. So they've received full knowledge that they deliber deliberately sin. So they think that because they know they did wrong, that... They make a animal sacrifice to try to uh, still be in good grace. Let's um, go a little further so that we, it, from the text, narrow down what this deliberate sinning is. Because it's not a general deliberate sin like I alluded to earlier when some Christians misinterpret and think, oh, I sin deliberately, so this is talking about me. I didn't say what sinning deliberately was. I just said, no, it's not talking about you when you know the speed limit is 45 and you deliberately go 50. That's not what this text is talking about. So let's hold that thought and see if we can make it fuller in the verses to come. And if we don't, bring me back there. Okay. So when the, the we he's talking about, is he addressing believing Hebrews or all Hebrews? Is this message for all of them? Or is he at this point addressing those that... 
have confessed belief in the Messiah? I think to be gracious, <clears throat> because of the plural pronoun, we, he's giving opportunity for anyone to be included. Any of us religious people. Because the similarity that all of us have in this conversation is we've come to at least profess with our mouth embracing from the epigenosos the truth, the full knowledge of the truth that Christ is the Messiah, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies we've been studying since we were kids. So all of us at some point have said out loud, we believe. Now he's about to make a distinction to say, okay, since we're all right at this moment, at this verse, he's placing us all in the same boat potentially. Now we know we can't all be in the same boat and we're not going to be in the same boat when we get to verse 39. But he's making room for if the shoe fits, wear it. So, in my humanity, I don't know the genuine nature of your salvation, if you're truly saved or not. So, the warning goes out to all of us. And it's good motivation for all of us to... I mean, the New Testament is replete with ideas of uh, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Know that Christ is in you, unless, of course, you don't pass the test and know that Christ is in you. So, everyone needs the encouragement on the team to pick up your knees, hustle, sprint all the way through the base. Don't let up. Prior, you don't know when the throw's coming in. Your job is to get past first base. So, if we were to slow down prior to getting to first base, we might get thrown out and prove ourselves to be on the bench, off the field. So for now, let's let it potentially be for everyone who's listening. If we, if the shoe fits, wear it. If the shoe fits, try to find another shoe, <laughs> really. But good question. Go ahead. So if I understood his question and the two he was asking about, you don't... You, you think this could be speaking to unbelieving Hebrews? It, it, it is. It is going to prove itself in this verse here. This message is for the unbelieving, apostatizing Hebrew. Yes. What about those who uh, even who don't claim Jesus as Messiah? Is that what you're referring to? No. Okay. If you haven't claimed Jesus as Messiah, you can't apostatize. Okay. You can't fall away. Right. And this, this section of verses is specifically addressing falling away. So it's, it's specifically so it's specifically addressing those who claim to be part of the church, whether they are or not. They, those They're not. To be. They claim to be, right. yes. but past tense, they claim to be. Because let's go on and consider present actions. Present actions, they go on sinning deliberately. They once claimed to be part of embracing this change of Christ is the Messiah. The prophecies are fulfilled. Us Jews are, are going to be Messianic Jews, believing Jews, Christians, following Christ, the Messiah. Okay? But, a, a subs, but some of these people are now going on sinning deliberately after receiving this full knowledge of the gospel, and the writer warns, if we do this, there's no longer sacrifice for sin. We are just got in way over our head, deep water. Come. Verse 27. So, a sacrifice for sins has been historically understood as a good thing. Appeasing God, uh, staying off the judgment consequences. I mean, the animal got some consequences. Um, so uh, that's a positive sense. What's the other side of the coin? Verse 27. Everybody ready to go to that? 
Frankie, Sky, Tom, y'all ready to go to that? Thumbs up? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. 27. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries, period. Instead of, for you who go on sinning deliberately against the gospel, that Christ is the Messiah, instead of there being some other sacrifice for your sins that can take care of it and make you okay with God, the opposite is what's waiting for those in the plural pronoun we who are guilty of this. The opposite. What you have to look forward to is a fear as you expect rightful judgment on sin, which every Hebrew did have an accurate concept of sinning against the holy God, and from that comes judgment. That's a normal part of their life, their upbringing, their, their education. So you don't look forward to judgment. You're, it's like, oh, I expect this because I've been taught, and I know, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, you know you're going to answer to God. You know he's there. You know what's right. You know because he made you to know him because you're made in his image. So you know and you're fearing that day. That's why you want to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Like, turn the radio up louder. Give me another alcoholic beverage, illicit drug. Let me escape the reality that my conscience is telling me you're going to answer to God. You're going to answer to God. He's not going to be happy with you. You're going to get judgment. It's not going to go well for you. Let me suppress the truth and unrighteousness, try to drown that out, because I can't go to sleep at night when all I have is a fearful expectation of the judgment that is rightfully going to come to me in my rebellion against God. And a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries, which makes me think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And turning up the furnace ten times hotter than normal such that the guard who was throwing the three guys in died executing his duties of taking them to their execution. He got executed because he got too close to the... He wasn't guilty of anything. He was a faithful servant of the king, bowing down, yeah. Worship you, king, earthly king. But he died because he got too close to the fury of the fire of that earthly judgment that some earthly king says, you violated the law, you violated the commands of the sovereign, and so you're going to pay. And the writer says, what you have to look forward to is a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Whom will this fire consume? The adversaries of who? Are genuine believers ever referred to in the Holy Scriptures as adversaries of God? No. So if you are included in this plural pronoun we, if we, then fiery fury, adversaries of God. The we that are being addressed right at this moment are adversaries of God. By definition, you can't be in Christ and be an adversary of God. That helps me think through these words and who the plural pronoun is referring to. It must and can only be speaking to an unbeliever. Because whom the Lord loveth, he chastens, disciplines, just like we're praying to be better parents, better fathers, discipline consistently, correctly, because that's what God established it to be. That's the right thing. But we don't consume our children with fire because they're our adversaries because they ate the last chocolate chip cookie. We don't have that attitude to our children, nor does God have that attitude towards his children in Christ. Because when God sees you, believer, he sees... Christ, yeah. Perfect. Sinless. Huh. That's why I'm pleased with you, Shannon, because when I see you, I see Jesus, who's perfect. 
make sense. But when he sees someone outside of Christ, he's here is a rebel spitting in my face, my enemy, an evildoer against me, kicking at the goats. <sighs> Destruction, condemnation. So, interestingly, you know, when you read this, you know, so often we think the God of the Old Testament is the ogre, is the mean guy, is the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, kill the women and children. I'd say we... Yes, we have a fuller picture of his love in the New Testament, for sure, but I think we also have a fuller picture of his wrath in the New Testament. It's, it's serious right now. Okay, we're going to continue to clarify who the plural pronoun we in verse 26 is as we get to 28, but before we go there, anybody? Hearing no one, seeing no one, I'm going to go to 28. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses, all right, who are we talk to? Hebrews, do they know about the law of Moses? Yes. yes. So as that zebra says on uh, Madagascar, now you're talking my crack a -lack language. <laughs> They, they, they know the vocabulary words he's using. He's using an analogy. He's using an example that is totally familiar to his audience. They understand. Yeah, okay. Um, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses, got it, dies without mercy. Definition of mercy again? Receiving what you... Don't deserve. That's grace. And I love that vocabulary word, so I'm glad you said it. Mercy, Matt, I think you were trying to... Withholding deserved punishment. Withholding that what you do deserve. And it's mostly punishment, yes, in every context. So, without mercy, because if you got mercy, then you wouldn't get the punishment you deserved. And you deserve punishment, why? Because you set us all the, the, the law of Moses, the commandments, which requires death. So, anyone who, who disregards the law of Moses, you know the law of Moses. I've taught you since you're a baby. You know you shall not murder, but you, you set it aside. You, you violated intentionally, deliberately the law of Moses. You killed this guy. Well, then you're going to die without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So, I can't just make it up because I don't like Greg. I'm like, yeah, he he killed this guy. Okay, kill him. No, we got to have two or three witnesses to verify this, not just a personal vendetta against Brian. So they're like, yeah, I get it. That I grew up understanding that that's fair, that when someone violates the law of Moses, they die without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Yep, we're all in agreement because we're good Jews. We're religious people. We've done our homework. We've been to Sunday school or Saturday school, as it would have been for them. And uh, and we know this concept, and we agree. Does everyone here agree with that? Any questions on that? Good. Same sheet of music. Then verse 29. Going to go from an argument from the lesser to the greater. Moses was the messenger. Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, if, if you're going to violate what God said through his messenger, his prophet, Moses, that he gave the, the, the message through, if you're going to violate the son, you know, it's going to be a bigger deal, right? Because when, when your worker comes and gives you the message, it's one thing, but when the owner sends his own son, that's a, that's a much bigger thing. There's... You know, in the, Pete, if I'm wrong, but uh, the king or queen's son is, is called a prince. Yeah. yeah, and a daughter's princess. And that's not a title. They just hand out to anybody. It signifies it's kind of a big deal. Yeah, royalty. So, how much worse punishment? And, by the way, um, what, uh, what do you mean worse punishment? I thought we just talked about he dies. <laughs> 
<laughs> what are you, you gonna give me 40 lashes after I'm dead? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's not gonna be any worse for me. I'm dead. Where are you gonna go when you're dead? Then? Yeah. Yeah, you shouldn't fear those who kill the body only, but he who kills the body and the soul. I remember somebody saying that in the New Testament. Yeah. H how much worse punishment the audience says to his, uh, the, the writer says to his religious audience, do you think? religious person who knows the law of Moses and understands this concept as being rational, will be deserved by the one. Who's the one? The one in the plural pronoun we from verse 26. The one who finds himself in the plural pronoun we of 26 who is going on sinning deliberately after receiving the full knowledge of the gospel. How much more is that person going to deserve worse punishment than death if that person has trampled underfoot the Son of God. It's one thing to trample underfoot the servant, you know. You're a duke. I think that's another title, right, Pete? You're a duke of Edinburgh, and you, you know, I send one of my servants out because I'm the king, and you trample him underfoot. Well, that's one thing. You're going to be in trouble. But I send the prince out to your house, and you trample him underfoot, then you just way more of a big deal. So you trample him underfoot, which, I mean, what, what a descriptor. Tell me some things that we trample underfoot. Ants. Ants. They come out of the palm trees. There's three different sizes. The small, super fast. The medium, okay fast. And, and, uh, and the, the big, slow ones. And those are my favorite. I give 50 points for those. And by the way, the flip-flops you gave me are not good for that because they have traction and there's too many grooves and they get away. I'm like, what, what, what? Anyway, um... Ants, good example. Trample underfoot. What else do we trample underfoot? Well, I've seen people trample underfoot a cigarette butt. Uh, seen people trample underfoot. I mean, if you trample something underfoot, by definition, how? It's discarded. It's, discarded. it's, discarded. it's just, it's, it's nothing. You don't think anything about it. When I flew the F-16, uh, they covered the seats in uh, uh, lamb's wool, make it a little more comfortable. And the crew chiefs were very protective of the seat cover. Uh, sir, don't ever step on that seat cover. That is not a place for your boot. Uh, it's a comfortable seat, and we take good care of it and you're not to trample it underfoot. And so it's a gymnastics act getting in the F-16 cockpit because it's a broomstick, it's tiny up there, and you're like, Ugh, I can't step on that, that's a stick. I can't step on that, that's the throttle. I can't step on that, that's the glass multifunction display. I can't step on that, that's the radio. I mean, where am I, how am I supposed to get in here? You know, I need to really just step on that big seat so I can get my feet down in the rudder pedals. Anyway, you know, don't trample it underfoot. Things that you value, you don't trample underfoot. And God the Father's Son is the most valuable, right? The, the Prince. So you, nobody, um, the one, will be deserved by the one. The one doesn't even have a name or a title. And you're going to trample underfoot the capital S Son of God? And you think that's going to go well for you? Like, who in their right mind would think that? This person is described further as profaning the blood of the covenant. Profaning. Profanity. Vulgar inappropriate, taking something that's holy and set apart and treating it as common or normal or dirty, something that's clean and making it dirty. Anytime Heather uses a white tablecloth, I always profane it. It never looks the same again. 
after I get done with gravy or hot sauce or something. The blood of the covenant. I mean, the Jewish people, they know about covenants, right? been several covenants that they've studied in the Old Testament, and they know about blood because we've been talking about blood sacrifices and how God uh, has put up with them in some way because of the, the animal sacrifices. Acts chapter 17, maybe. For the verse that says that God was patient overlooking sins of the past. Verse 30. Acts 17, verse 30. The times of ignorance, that would be the opposite of epigenosos. That would be the opposite of Hebrews 10, 26, having a full knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've talked about that for the third time. The Old Testament wasn't completely clear. They were, in a sense, ignorant. They didn't know exactly who the Messiah was when he was going to come. The times of ignorance got overlooked. Were they sinning in the Old Testament? Yes. Did the animal sacrifices take away their sins? No. Would God have been justified to strike them all dead? Yes. Did God still save some of them? Of course. By faith. We'll get to that next chapter. But now, back to Acts 18, 1730. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he's appointed. That's Jesus. Uh, and this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Kind of a big deal. So, in the past, they were the benefactors of God's uh, patience that he didn't come down and um, expend his wrath on their sin that he allowed them to go through these rituals and the sacrificial system and, and say okay we're just going to be good with that for now because he knew his plan and that the wrath would be poured out on the Lamb of God so my whole point is understanding the covenant relationship between God and his people and specifically how blood was a part of that as we already covered, I think, in chapter 9, without the, uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So these people, they understood the blood of the covenant is my long-winded point. And what they've done with it, they've profaned it. Now here's another opportunity to get confused. By which he was sanctified. You may be tempted to connect by which he was sanctified to the previous phrase, phrase by the one. But I think it's more accurate to be connecting by the, the phrase by which he was sanctified to the Son of God. Christ's sacrifice on the cross sanctified him, set him apart as the one and only perfect holy sacrifice of God. It doesn't make sense that the blood of the covenant sanctified the unbeliever, the adversary of God, in a salvific way. We've already referred to them as the advers as adversaries, subjects of fury and fire and judgment, fearful. So it doesn't make sense that, that they would have been sanctified. Because if, if you're sanctified in, in a salvific sense, then when, Jesus, when God the Father sees you, he sees Jesus, and so you're good. So it doesn't make sense to connect that. It makes sense to connect 
the fact that Jesus Christ, through his obedience, his incarnation, and his subjection and submission to the Father, sanctified himself. He was purified. He was proven holy, set apart, different than all of us. That, that's what makes the descriptor, he was a supreme sacrifice, true. He was set apart from all the other sacrifices. His sacrifice was sanctified. So, let's, let's read it all again, 29. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one, the apostate, the person who said, okay, yeah, I'm on board, yep, Jesus is the Messiah, but now is like, nah, I'm not. I'm, I'm trampling underfoot the Son of God, Jesus, the one you're calling the Messiah, the one I'm no longer calling the Messiah, and I, I'm profaning, I'm treating it as normal blood. I'm saying Jesus was not God. He's not the Messiah. His blood was just like my blood. It's just normal blood. I'm profaning his holy righteous blood from the cross of Calvary. I'm offending God the Father. I'm offending God the Son in the final phrase of verse 29. And this person, this one who's doing this, who is going on sinning willfully against the full uh, exposure to the truth of the gospel, he's outraged the spirit of grace. We, we talk about how we don't need to discipline our kids in, in an outrage. God doesn't discipline us in an outrage. He lovingly disciplines us. And so the spirit of grace, which Sky accurately defined as receiving that which we don't earn or don't deserve, and certainly the Messiah, the Savior of the world, taking away your sins is something you don't deserve, and you're regenerated, you're born again by the Holy Spirit of God, the spirit of grace. The spirit of grace has been outraged because the spirit of grace is able to do what he's able to do in regenerating you because of the work, the completed sanctified work that the Son of God did on your behalf and you reject that and you trample it underfoot, you just made the list. You, you, you just got on my bad side and, and there's, no, there's no getting off of that bad side. You denounce the Christ, you deny the Christ Game over. Outraged the spirit of grace. Verse 29. There, I, there's a lot of talking from, from me on that verse. What else do we need to say or what can we say a different way to make it clearer than it's been said? All right. Sorry, I just obviously he's speaking specifically to them in this letter, um, but I think there's so many people. It's, it's just very common in our, in in my mind, in my my perception of at least the American church. Um, there's so many people who claim the name of Christ yet, by the way they're living their lives. I mean, they're they're they claim to. They claim the name of Christ. They claim to represent him, yet the way they're representing him is totally profaning his name. Um, so, do they receive a, a strict judgment that <laughs> someone who never claims someone who never claims the name of Christ? I believe this the, the, this passage is saying that they do. They do. So, um, so I mean, I know we've kind of been talking and kind of referring more to just. Um, who the author is writing to, but to kind of bring it into modern modern day, I think there's so many people in at least the American church who fall into that kind of thing. So. Anyone who goes on sinning deliberately against the truth that Christ is the Messiah and lives in an unfaithful way to that truth consistently, habitually, as a pattern of normal behavior by their deliberate sinning, denies the fact that they are a genuine believer. Second Peter chapter 2, But false prophets also arose among the people, 
just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. I mean, there's preachers in the pulpit who are false prophets, false teachers, denying the truth of who Christ really is. On CNN, how must a person be saved? Do they really have to come through Jesus? Well, you know, I just believe there are many ways to come to God, and I'm going to leave that up between God and that person. That's what I heard the famous popular preacher say to Larry King. Opposite of what John MacArthur says when Larry King asks him the same question. Yeah, absolutely. There's only one way. Through Jesus Christ. Yeah. False prophet and serious wrath, fire, fury of God in modern times. Anyone who has a full intellectual explanation and exposure to the knowledge of the gospel of Christ and goes on sinning deliberately against that truth. It's not good. The Spirit of Grace is outraged against false teachers, false prophets, and false believers, false professors, who say, yeah, I'm a Christian. And then, you know, you look at them, you're like, the only thing about you as Christian is the fact that you just said that. That's, that would be the only thing that makes me think according to what I've read in the scriptures, that you're a believer. Yeah, that, it's applicable to some people today, not just to the religious Hebrews that the writer is speaking to somewhere between 60 and 70 A.D. That's the definition of an apostate, though, basically, is what? Falling away. Yeah. So, if you would adhere to the truth of the gospel you would live it. Yeah. And so, although they may not necessarily be professing a fall away, which, which that is certainly, you know, the complete and honest reality of some people, and we've talked about that uh, even over the last couple of years, some celebrity, well-known people who've said, yeah, I'm no longer a Christian. Um, but I think it's possible to fall away in your actions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like those three words you say, I am a Christian... I really don't mean anything compared to all the other things that you're saying in your life through your post on Facebook and the things you entertain yourself with and the other every other word that comes out of your mouth and the places you go and the things you do. You have fallen away from that truth of the gospel that calls you to live holy and separate lives. And I think, I think the confusion that some people have when they hear falling away is that in order to fall away, you have to be a part of that thing. Um, so it, when you when you think of it like that, you think of they have to be a part of that thing. Well, they must be a Christian in order to fall away from it. But I know uh, that's not that's yeah. not what he's referring to. They're yeah. claiming to be a part of it. They're yeah. they are hearing that they have the knowledge. Yeah. They're hearing the gospel, and they might be a part of the fellowship. It might be a part of the congregation, but it doesn't mean they're a part of the body. And and that's been true since the beginning of the book, hasn't it? Go back and look at the Jews. I mean, yeah, they're all Jews, right? So they are Jews, but a lot of them fell away from what does it mean to be a Jew? They abandoned it. They didn't stay faithful to it. And Paul talks about that in Romans. 8, 9, 10, 11 maybe. Um, a lot. So, yes. Yes. And that's what Peter was saying. Not only are they going to be a member of your church, they're going to be a pastor teacher in that church and be false. Not adhering to the truth of the gospel. Living for themselves. Sensuality. Sexual sense. Yeah. 
So to be associated with and identify with the Christian church is sufficient to fall away from in your thoughts, words, and actions. So that's a that's a very good application clarification. Thanks for for bringing that up. Um, now you know one of the is it First John two where it's kind of a classic apostasy phrase <coughs> maybe around 19 or something yeah first John 2 18 children it is the last hour and as you've heard that Antichrist is coming so now many Antichrists have come therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. I mean, go back to the parable of the wheat and the tares. And we're saying, oh, man, there's a bunch of tares in the wheat. You want us to go cut them down? Nope. Let them stay there till the harvest. Because if you go and you try to cut out all the tares right now, you're going to cut down the wheat. It's not going to be good for the crop. Just wait till the harvest, and then we'll sift it, and we'll burn and fire all the tares. That's Jesus talking about. Yeah. True believers, unbelievers. But those tears are nestled right up in, and amongst, in between, and blending in, camoed up. Yeah, I'm, I'm wheat, I'm wheat, I'm wheat. No. Upon further examination, do you have the kernel? Do you have the fruit? No. No, you're not. False. That's why, you know, this Hebrews and James, James especially gets a bad rap, you know, because it's because of the emphasis on works. But again... You know, they'll know that you're my disciples for the love that you have for one another. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. You don't get saved by works, but someone who has genuine faith is working, is doing works of righteousness, is doing the will of the Father who sent him, is what Jesus said, and you're a Christian, a Christ follower. So that's the norm. Yes, there can there there can and will be exceptions uh, to for you stumbling or missing the mark on occasion. You're going to have to confess your sin and and move on because you're not perfect. I'm not perfect, but the norm is we're striving for obedience and we're producing fruit of righteousness. There's a difference, and people stop cursing when you're around because they notice they're like, man, this guy's different than everybody else I hang out with. All right, so that's verse 29. We good? Yeah, all right. Looking good on the screen. Verse 30. For we, again, we, all of us in this room, we know him who said, what's he doing now? He's justifying what he just said. Like, look, I'm not exaggerating when I say how much worse punishment is, gonna, is it going to be. For the person who falls away from Christ is the Messiah. It's going to be terrible. And, and, and we know this, right? We know I'm not just making this up because we know from all the Old Testament that we've had growing up, we know some of the things that we've had memorized and we've quoted before. One of them is, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Anybody got their little notes there where that's coming from in the Old Testament? Deuteronomy, Song of Moses, 32, and we've got, uh, that's uh, 35 that we just read. Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and their doom comes swiftly. So, this is God speaking about his enemies. Now, 
Here's an interesting point for you to consider and to pass on to Pastor Craig in case he doesn't listen tonight. This quote here, it says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. That's not exactly what the Hebrew says. I just read in, in 32, 35, Vengeance is mine and recompense. It's not exactly what's said in the Septuagint, but it is exactly what is quoted in Romans 12, 19. Fascinating. We do know who wrote Romans. Um, we don't know who wrote this, but we know that the paraphrase that the author of Hebrew gives for Deuteronomy 32 is the exact same quoted paraphrase given in Romans 12, 19, which is neither the Hebrew exact nor the Septuagint. Uh, interesting. I don't know enough to have a strong opinion about who wrote Hebrews, but I find that, you know, interesting as, as, as just a point of interest. <laughs> vengeance is mine, I will repay. So, vengeance is God. God is the one who's, we're talking about pouring out fury and fire on his adversaries. So, you know what I just said, it's not an exaggeration, because he's been saying this is who he is all along. And again, the Lord will judge his people. That's from verse 36, which actually says, for the Lord will vindicate his people in the ESV. So uh, there's a sense in which, you know, he's drawn both sides. Like adversaries, hammer's coming down. God's people, going to take care of them. But the point certainly here is, verse 31, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You do not want to mess this up. There's nothing worse than you personally and individually without a mediator, without a representative, having to meet God face to face on your own merits and explain yourself why you trampled his son underfoot and why you outraged his spirit of grace. I do not want to be in the room, in the house, in the neighborhood when that goes down. It's going to be a fearful expectation of judgment, fury, and fire that's going to consume you for eternity, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whew. I'm exhausted thinking through the, the depth of this warning that the writer is giving to these people and that, that he's giving to us to say, look, this is why I'm saying, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he promises faithful, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, and, and not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, and maybe because though some are in danger of being the, the we in verse 26 or, or the one in verse 29, and you do not want to fall into that fearful camp, so encourage one another, verse 25, and all the, all the more as you see the day drawing near. We read Peter say, it's the last time, and we read John say, it's the last hour. And so open your eyes to say, all the apostles are saying, it's time to get serious. Everything's been revealed. Epikinosos. All the truth is laid out here. We don't need any other mystery solved. Puzzle complete. No missing pieces. Follow Christ. Turn from your sins and worship in yourself. Follow Christ. Cling to him. And help your brother cling to him. And don't let him get away with saying, Hey, I'll see you tonight at Bible study. And then he doesn't see you tonight. Call him, text him, stop by his house, check on him. Hey, I want to stir you up to love. Love me. Why? I need you. We were there at church. And we had a left arm and a right arm and a left leg. But we didn't have a right leg. It meant somebody needed to kick a field goal 
But we didn't even have a right leg. So you think we got those three points? No, we didn't. Why? Because you decided it was a good idea to forsake the assembling together. So we missed the field goal because you were at home. You, you weren't even there, man. You've got to be there. You've got to assume that we're going to need to kick another field goal. I need you there to kick a field goal. It makes me excited when you score three points, man. I'm like, yes, we're going to win. Uh, put me in, coach. I want to go hit somebody. I need you. I can't preach to nobody. I can't teach Bible study to nobody. That does not encourage me. But the fuller the room is, the more encouraged I am. Like, you mean, I got all these teammates. I don't have to heavy lift on my own. We can do a team lift. That telephone pole becomes super light when the likes of those tattooed arms get around it next to those big arms with a gold bracelet, next to that arm with a brace on it to make it stronger. <laughs> next thing you know, yeah, we can do this. But if it's just me and I'm staring at that telephone pole, that's all that's going to happen. I'm just going to stare at that telephone pole. But you got to stir me up, man, to love and good deeds. Yeah, let's take that telephone pole and haul it all the way across town. And then stand it up and put a light on top of it and let it shine. And sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. <laughs> that is funny. I'm laughing at myself. I mean, you know half the stuff I say is, I had no idea I was going to say that, right? Which is good and bad. Like, sometimes I shouldn't say it. Um, anyway. Okay, that, I think that took us through verse 31. What, what else do you got up to this point? Yeah, and that's why I like, you know, in verse 26 says, for if we, right. and the author is including himself, I'm, I'm a human this side of heaven too. If I do this, I'm in the same boat. And, and it's possible. We all are up against the same possibilities of being stupid and falling short. Yeah. Yes, we have different areas of giftedness. But we all have the same areas of weakness and fault and failure. We're all exactly the same as far as that goes. And so it is good for us to remember our own frailty as we attempt to love each other well. And I generally respond better to you when you come up and put your arm around me rather than neck throat punch me. I just I breathe better for one. My eyes don't tear up as much, too. And so I need to remember that. Like, I, I'm like you. I, I love to throat punch people. 
But that is not my job. That's the Lord's job. If he wants to take it to that level, he's the only one smart enough to know if you need a throat punch. I just need to be loving you, trying to stir you up to love and good deeds. And I need you to do the same thing for me. That's a good reminder. Shannon, what do you want to talk about? Well, it's just... It's, it's amazing to me that my mom and I had this conversation yesterday. And, you know, I've, I've shared in the past that, that I was raised in the Catholic faith and my mom, she was, she's Baptist, met my dad, she converted to Catholicism for him, and since she's been back in Louisiana, she's wanted to go back to, you know, her Baptist church that she, that she went to when she was a kid with her sisters and all this kind of stuff, and, and we were talking about how she always felt like she was being judged by her sister. And it's just amazing. We everything we've gone over tonight, we talked about. Wow. And it's like it's just I, I'm like I'm giddy with excitement. You know, I mean, it was just, <laughs> yeah. it's just amazing that we we talked about we talked about judgment and we talked about wheat and tares and we talked about you know the fruits of the vine and you know it's it's just. Just in awe, you know? Yeah. You, you remind me, one of you was talking about judgment. Stricter judgment, maybe. Remember when uh, Jesus was handed over to Pilate? John 19, 10. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, <laughs> You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has a greater sin. Judas was the ultimate apostate, living and breathing, working with the Son of God every day. Full knowledge. Pilate, he had no idea what he was talking about. He's trying to ask people, hey, who is this guy? Who do you say he is? Who does he say it is? What is truth? I'm so clueless here. And Jesus said, yeah. You are clueless. And that's why your judgment's not going to be as strict as Judas. <laughs> so there are varying degrees based upon knowledge. It's greater the knowledge, greater the judgment. Uh, Frankie, what do you want to talk about? Got to come off mute. Yeah. Got to come off mute first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm good right now. Okay, great. Tom, what do you want to talk about? Very, it's been very enlightening. Well, all right. Well, you better go back and read it again. To make sure yeah. <laughs> I wasn't making stuff up. <laughs> Sky, what do you want to talk about? I think I think a big thing for me was, was that last bit was it's easy to get caught up too. Like you bring the, the first couple verses together with the last. You know, vengeance is mine, say the Lord, but we're also called to spur on our brothers and sisters and, and to give warning and to help them and come alongside them, you know, and not, not confuse the two. Like, don't confuse helping out your brother or sister when you see that maybe they're, they're going the wrong direction with being judgmental or being a judge and jury, you know what I mean? Do it in love, and then you're not being... You're not taking vengeance at all. You're just, and you're not being judged. You're not being judged. You're just trying to, trying to spur the team on. Yeah. Good. Rob, what do you want to talk about? Well, I just take exception with one thing you said. You okay. Said we all have the same weakness. That would be great if we all had. I the meant, same uh, I meant sin. I, I meant in general. Yeah. I, I didn't mean that I specifically... That's a big point of contention is that the spec, you know, in your eye, I can see clearly, but yeah. I yeah. don't see the log in my yeah. eye. Yeah, no, uh, you're right. It takes on different shapes and forms and times. I just meant we have the same sickness of uh, uh, sin. Yeah. 
Yeah, rebellion against God, pride. Yeah. I can, I, yeah. Good and clarification. That's, that's where we sit down and start going, well, you know, this must be talking about you. Because <laughs> this one isn't my problem. This is your problem. <laughs> uh, I don't want to get to that verse from where it talks about my problem. Right. Let's stay on this verse. Yeah, let's stay on Greg's problem. Greg, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> my problems. <laughs> I'm good, thank you. All right. George, anything you want to talk about? Well, I think it's very clear, you know, what's in store if you're not. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I need help walking around with that as my reality more often. It just, it, the depth of that and the seriousness of that escapes me too often. I think if I were more cognizant of that reality, I would be more motivated. Uh, to love, yeah. Pete, what are you want to talk about? I was just thinking about Pilate. You know when he said he's, uh, he didn't know what was going on. He, he, can't, he didn't, but I think he had a pretty good idea of what was going on. He just didn't want to admit it. <laughs> it was against his law. You know, he, yeah. He can't. He was selfish. Yeah, and he just wanted to get out of it without yeah. nobody noticing. It's me, right? And right. I, and I, I feel myself doing that sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I am comfortable saying that we're all selfish. Yeah. Jay, what are you going to talk about? Okay. All right, well, uh, there's no way I can uh, cover any significant ground in seven minutes. And in my Bible, there's a paragraph break. The good news is uh, it's encouragement next week. So... Yeah, this week was was rough, but there is encouragement in the verses that follow. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the bad news makes the good news better. It provides a, an appropriate contrast that will cause you to rejoice in the good news of the gospel. So, Father, thank you for your word and the good news it contains. May we take to heart the reality of your holiness and how vengeance is your and your wrath will be poured out on your adversaries use us as your instruments to be loving and kind to others just as you have been loving and kind to us through the Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray amen, amen. thank you Brian. thank you thanks